my sweet chariot coming for to carry me home swing What do you know about grief? How do you deal with it yourself? And likewise, how would you help someone else in dealing with it? These thoughts and questions are certainly the things we're going to attempt to discuss today as we come into the heading and the topic of understanding grief. You know, when we think about grief, perhaps we most likely think about grief concerning death. For example, the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and following, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me in that day, but not unto me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Friends, back there in verse 6 of that particular passage, we learn that Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. The Greek word there, offered, literally means I'm about ready to be poured out or let loose. And when we think about that, we understand the apostle was most likely by inspiration, of course, but speaking of his own death. If historians are correct, and I believe that they are, the apostle Paul lost his life in the city of Rome and most likely lost his life by the way of beheadal. Now, certainly there would have been some grief for his own body as he was a human being leading up to that. But I can almost be certain and positive. As many men and women who loved Paul, those children perhaps he had even uh, come in contact with through his life, there was probably a great grieving process that took place after his death. But do you realize that grief doesn't just have to do with the death of a loved one, a family member, a friend? No, actually death is only one part of the grieving process. For example, many people often grieve concerning not only death, but also disease. I know in my life, as I was facing heart transplants some, some several months ago, my family and I all had to grieve even before the possibility of death was real and true. My daughter particularly had a struggle. She had a terrible time in dealing and facing the idea of me having such a disease, this heart disease, that potentially could take my life. And so oftentimes when a loved one is sick, whether it be with heart disease or cancers or, or anything of that sort, anything that's potentially life-threatening or debilitating, there's a grieving process that go, they go through during that period of time. Also, we ought to consider grief as it takes place in the midst of divorce sometimes. You know, divorce is rampant in our society. More and more, we meet with people who have been divorced one or two or maybe even several more times than that. And every time a divorce takes place, oftentimes if you'll sit down with those individuals and you'll ask them to be open and honest about the situation, they'll tell you that it was just as painful, if not more so, even than that of death or disease. Now, you might ask the question, why is that? Well, you see, when someone passes from this life, particularly when they die, those situations and those relationships are done. And we realize as humans, we've come to know that there's nothing we can do to change that. There's nothing we can do to reverse it. And so we simply begin the grieving process and eventually make our way through those things. And we make our way on into brighter days. But divorce oftentimes leaves behind such painful scars, such debilitating uh, situations to where even family members, in-laws, brothers, sisters, children especially can be involved. And sometimes these things can be rather nasty as we say. These divorces can be difficult. And so there's a grieving process that one must go through even after divorce. But I want to consider with you today, and I want to think about it from several perspectives. Number one, I want to consider with you what I'm going to entitle the proclamation concerning understanding grief. What I mean by that is we're going to look at some of the words of the Bible, particularly the words of our Lord, and see how he would deal with grief. Second, we're going to understand the process. As some have decided, and, and I'm not the scholar behind this, but have decided there's about a 10-part process that we go through when we're enduring grief. And of course, these checklists we're going to mention in a moment will help us, Lord willing, to make our way and wade through the waters of grief. And then thirdly, we're going to notice, if you will, a procedure. And that is particularly one used by our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane and how he dealt with grief, how he would deal with struggles in life such as you and I would often have to endure. Now to begin with, we discuss this idea of a proclamation. Notice the words of our Lord, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, 
And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Certainly when Jesus spake these words, he was speaking to his own disciples, the followers, the best friends in the world that he had among these twelve. And he was encouraging them in light of his intimate death that was nigh at hand, not to be so grievous as to where they would be harmed by it. Now certainly Jesus was not telling them in these words, let not your heart be troubled. He was not telling them not to grieve at all. He understood that was going to be a part of the natural and human process. But he was encouraging them not to allow grief to pull them down. Because in the scripture he went on to offer them hope. He went on to offer them a promise of going and preparing that place, that place called heaven, in the which he would be found and later they could be found too if they're only obedient to his word. Now you and I are not those apostles. We're not those disciples among the twelve of that day. But the promise and the proclamation still stands the same. Jesus encourages us in the wake of the death or loss of some loved one that we understand there is hope. There was hope for them if they were obedient on this side of eternity. And even better than that, there is hope for us. And so I want to encourage you as you go through this, understand this proclamation. Jesus does not want us to be troubled. We also understand and know several other words that are found in the Bible that are meant to encourage us. The Apostle Paul intended to inspire us. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning verse 13, Paul wrote these words, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those which are asleep, or those that have died, that ye sorrow not, even as others do, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, that by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. You continue on there in verse 16 and he tells us, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, he said, shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now watch the last phrase here in verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Friend, the Apostle Paul, if you will, set a mouthful in these scriptures. He tells us to begin with that we need not be ignorant concerning death. He tells us that even in light of death, we ought to be encouraged because there is a life after this death. If again, like Jesus would say, if we're only obedient to the will of God, he would help us to understand that death itself was something that must be faced but we face it in the heavens and we face it looking forward to the possibility of meeting those loved ones again, as he says. And when we understand that, I want you to realize that last phrase I emphasize. These are the only words, if you will, of the New Testament. When it concerns the idea of death and our ultimate resurrection in heaven, these are the only words that are ever spoken where we're commanded by that last phrase. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Friends, because of that, I rarely could ever attend or be a part of uh, delivering a eulogy at a funeral without including these words here. These are words of encouragement. We also find in yet another passage in our New Testaments. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning, the Bible says, uh, To be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Friends, these again are wonderful words. In the wake of someone passing this life, their death, we as humans who are left behind can, can think on or focus on these things, these things that are good and honest and pure and so forth is listed. And because of that, we too can be encouraged. We move on in this. The Bible tells us there in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue or if there be any praise, think on these things. Again, we have a command there at the end to focus our minds on these types of things. And so because of that, this proclamation can be so encouraging. But not only did I want to discuss with you the proclamation, but I also want to discuss with you the process. And let me disclaim this to begin with by saying this 10-part process we're about to discuss is not something I came up with on my own. No, this was set together by many statistics that have been gathered throughout the years from those who deal with many more grieving people than I would ever desire to deal with. 
For example, psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors and even Christian counselors who spent countless hours with individuals trying to help them deal with their grief have gathered these things statistically and found out that this is a typical process. As a matter of fact, that's the second part of my disclaimer. That is to let you know this 10-part process is only that which is typical. And that's not to say that if you don't deal with these things in the same way as we list them or even the same order that you're atypical or that you're abnormal. That's just simply to say that you're not exactly like anybody else. You're going to deal with grief much differently than I and much differently even than the next person across the street or down the road. You'll deal with it much differently than anyone that you know, even close family members are going to deal with grief in various different ways. But this is a typical 10-part process through which we can measure our grief and perhaps we can even in some ways track it, if you will, to see how we're doing on the process. If we move from a normal day, as we're going to mention in a moment, back to the point of life where we think we can move on and go on with our lives. And we have to understand what takes place in between that. The beginning part of the process, and I put this on the screen each time, is the idea of normalcy, believe it or not. That's just simply to say that when the grieving process begins, it always begins with life being as normal as it always has. Maybe you're going about your day. Maybe you're doing things just as you always did. Maybe you've gone to school. Maybe you've gone to work. Maybe you're around the house doing some work. Maybe you're out shopping, whatever it is. And suddenly you receive news that some loved one, for example, has passed. You receive news that someone has been diagnosed with a debilitating disease. Or, or maybe you're faced with, unfortunately, as many are in our society today, the idea of divorce where your spouse comes in one occasion and just says, I don't love you anymore, I want a divorce. And we understand how difficult that can be. But all of these grieving processes start with that one thing, and that is normalcy. But from the normalcy, you find the news, which is what we just mentioned. The hearing of the words, someone has passed, someone is sick, someone wants a divorce, that news can oftentimes be terrible to hear. And that's a part of the grieving process. And as you move forward in that, you're also going to be faced with yet another part of the process, and that is the idea of disbelief. You know, particularly in the idea of death, when you hear that news initially, when that phone call comes, or when that loved one stops by to let you know whatever that case is, you simply want to say, I, I don't believe it. It's not possible that this person could have died. And sometimes we hear people saying, you know, I just talked to them a few minutes ago or yesterday, and I could remember the look on their face, and I know what their plans were, and I know what they plan to do for today. We simply don't want to believe it. Someone has rightly said concerning death that we as human beings are the only creatures that God created who are aware of death and we're doing everything we can to stop it or to ignore it. And I think that is the case. But oftentimes when we move through this from normalcy to the news to the disbelief, we oftentimes move yet another step in the process and that is to the idea of shock. Now particularly concerning death, this takes place in the loved one's hearts and minds maybe the day of the funeral or some days after. And that is that we're just so shocked by the news that we can hardly imagine that it's actually taken place. Oftentimes after a funeral, and I've heard many people say this, I've even thought it to be honest, we see family members there at the funeral, maybe at the funeral home or at the graveside or the church building, whatever it is, and we meet with them and we talk with them and maybe we even share a laugh or a chuckle and we leave that place telling everyone around us, oh, they're doing so well. They're doing surprisingly well. I'm shocked by how well they're doing. And, and although we honestly believe that, we want to believe it, certainly, in the hearts and minds of the individuals who are suffering with this grief and dealing with this whole process is simply shock that is set in. They cannot understand it. They do not yet comprehend it. And because of that, they're simply in a state of shock. And so inwardly, they're hurting. Inwardly, they're suffering. Inwardly, they're having difficulties. But outwardly, because of their shock, you and I may not notice from the outside. But in behind the idea of shock, we oftentimes find guilt. And this takes place not only just prior to and after, but sometimes for many months or days beyond the funeral. And that is to begin to question two basic areas. Number one, what could I have done to help this person? What could I have done to help them through this situation? What could I have done even sometimes we assume to prevent the death itself? And oftentimes there's very little, if anything, that could ever have been done to change the outcome of someone when they're in a situation where they're about to lose their lives. But yet we feel guilty. We feel like there must have been something overlooked. There must have been something we could have known. must have been something we could have done to, to stop death and to cause them to have life again. But friends, that's oftentimes, we know, not the case. In addition to that, we often feel guilty. 
And that's because we think about the life that that person lived and the life that we lived around about them. We begin to say, you know, I wish I'd told them I loved them one last time. I wish I'd, I'd sat down and talked with them more. I wish I'd have spent more time with them. I wish I'd have gone to the lake. I wish I'd have spent more time with them in their home enjoying meals or, or whatever it is. These regrets, if you will, that we have. It's all a part of the guilt that we suffer as we go through the grieving process. But in behind that of guilt, oftentimes we meet with yet another that you'll see here on the screen. And that is the idea of hostility. Now this is one oftentimes when we're in the middle of it, at least as far as the grieving process goes, we rarely understand it or comprehend it. We become hostile toward one another, especially those closest to us. Sometimes we become hateful. Angry words are oftentimes spoken. And we have no idea why that is. It's part of grief. It's our way of dealing with it, although we may not see it as being proper and right, and certainly it could get out of hand and, and that sort of thing, but it's a part of the grieving process. And even sometimes, believe it or not, there's some, some hostility shown toward that loved one that has passed. We begin to get angry with them for leaving us behind, for leaving us here on this side of eternity to await the rest of our lives, never to see them again on this side, and begin to become hostile toward them. There's some hatred, even sometimes anger that comes in. And of course, we don't want to feel that way. We're not intending on doing that. We don't mean anything by it, you say. But it's oftentimes what we deal with nonetheless. But in addition, the idea of hostility. You move yet another step in the grieving process. You oftentimes meet with those who are in despair. And that's just simply getting to the point where we typically stay for quite a while too, where we say, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know how I'm going to go on. I don't know how I'm going to continue to live and function and go about my daily life without this loved one. It's so terrible to consider, but yet it's something that we often face. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, and especially if we don't have good support from those outside of us or particularly support from God, we'll stay in that point of despair for so long of a time. And it's such a dreadful place to be. But even at that, we oftentimes move from despair onto sensitivity. And what I mean by that is now we get to basically the opposite of the, if you will, the shock. And at this point, we'll begin to have our feelings on our proverbial shoulders. We become very sensitive. Anything that is said or done, anything that reminds us, or we at least consider that may remind us of this lost loved one or this person who's, who's left us behind, we oftentimes feel a bit of sensitivity. We begin to cry. We begin to weep sometimes in front of people, and we're so embarrassed by it. We do everything that we can to try to cover it, to try to avoid it, but yet it happens. We become overly sensitive sometimes, at least in the eyes of others. But friends, we must understand each of these steps we discussed thus far and those that we'll complete within just a moment, all of these are part of the typical grieving process. All of these are parts of the things that we all endure from time to time as we grieve. So there's nothing wrong with showing our sensitivity. There's nothing wrong, if you will, with shedding a tear over a loved one, even weeping at times. And don't be ashamed to do it in front of others either. But not only do we understand the idea of the sensitivity, then if we're, if we're blessed enough, we can move from that on to the step called hope. And that's just simply to say that I was in despair. I've gotten sensitive. I understand that. I've been there, done that. But now I can see that there is hope. And oftentimes this hope is found in just the, the hope and desire, which that's all that hope is, desire coupled with expectation that I will be able to function in life. Maybe you've seen signs in your life. Maybe you've seen certain things get back to somewhat of a normal state. And so now you see the hope. As we often say in the Americas, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's where we all desire to be, doesn't it? At least when we have hope. At least when we have something to expect and desire at the same time. We seemingly have a little bit of life, if you will, put back into our proverbial lungs. But as we move on from that of hope, we finally get to the final step, and that is a step I can simply entitle as moving on. And that's only to say that now, as we've gone through this, we began with normalcy. We moved on through this. We heard the news. We found ourselves in the midst of great disbelief, shock. We even found ourselves being guilty or hostile toward other people. We found ourselves in the midst of despair, being sensitive, finding hope, and finally, we have an opportunity now to move on with life. Now, friends, I want to emphasize in this, we're not to say that if someone passes from this life that we'll ever look back and say, you know what, I'm just going on my life. I don't need them. I don't care for them. I don't love them anymore. Certainly that is not the case. We have to be very careful that we don't attempt to make it to this part of the process, yet the tenth step much too early. 
We don't want to skip so many steps between it that we get to a point, as I've seen one man do, his wife passed away, and just within a few hours of the funeral, he wanted everything out of the home. He wanted every remembrance, every picture off the walls that reminded him of his dear wife that he had had for so many decades. Friends, he was trying to move on, but it was much too early for him. Thank God for him that he had a loving family that saw what was happening and that encouraged him and even in some cases stopped him from doing that so that when he came to the step of moving on, finally one day he would actually be able to do it. So again, I want to remind you of these things. I want you to understand this is but a typical process. And this is a process through which we all go, but yet not maybe all in the same order. Uh, not certainly do we have to go through each of these 10 steps to be successful, but it is a good measuring bar, a mark through which we can measure ourselves to see how we're doing. When we're in the midst of grief, I've been even encouraged people in the past in using this same 10-part uh, process of this list. Take these things, put them on your refrigerator, put them somewhere where you'll see them daily, and watch yourself go through steps 1 through 10. And every day that you find yourself moving into yet another step, be encouraged by that. Have yourself a little celebration in your mind at least. And tell yourself, hey, today I'm, I'm not a four. Today I've made it to the step called six. Or today I'm not a six, I'm an eight. And you look forward to the day when, Lord willing, you'll become a ten. But at the same time, let me say this also. If you ever find yourself seemingly reverting back, don't be discouraged by that. It may be only for a moment or a short period of time, and there's nothing wrong with going back and, and backing up from that moving on, going back and having some of those thoughts of hostility or, or despair or disbelief or shock, whatever they were. It's okay to go back, but always look forward to moving forward and eventually to moving on. Keep that person's heart. Keep that person's mind at hand within your heart. Love them forever and continue on with your life as best that you can. Now, not only did I want to discuss with you today the proclamation, also we looked at the process, but finally I want to close by talking about the procedure. And I pray for this one. You'll go ahead and be grabbing your Bibles. Perhaps you can even pause the video and do so. And I want you to take view with me of one text found in Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. It's an instant in our Lord's life that was recorded. This probably the most awful scene that man could ever view. It's an instance where our Lord himself had made his way into the Garden of Gethsemane and was about to be taken by those Roman soldiers so that in the morning the process of his crucifixion might take place. Now the Bible records for us that Jesus was so grief-filled or sorrowful that it was even unto death. That is to say that Jesus had become so grieving, so grief-stricken, that death itself could have come upon him. The Bible also records that during that evening the stress from that grief was so high that as you were, the capillaries perhaps had burst from his forehead, and the Bible records that his sweat was, as it were, droplets of blood. And so certainly it was the case that he was grieved, perhaps beyond what many men could even imagine or comprehend, and certainly beyond what we would ever desire to endure. But in Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36, if you'll read with me, we'll find out something about how the Lord endured. That is the procedure that he used to endure that grief on that faith-filled night. Here in verse 36, the Bible reads and says, And then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took him and two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Verse 39. And he, that's Jesus, went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I will, but as thou wilt. Verse 40. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation. And the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went and prayed again a second time, and praying, saying, O Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found him asleep again, and their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away. And he prayed a third time, saying the same words, then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, Sleep now, take your rest, 
Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is to be betrayed and into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Now certainly this is the account as I just stated. It's the account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But I want to point out this procedure as we're calling it because there's several things involved here that Jesus took part in in order that he might make it through his grief. Number one, I want to focus our attention on saying this. Jesus, that faith-filled night, leaned on his friends in Gethsemane. There the Bible listed in verse 37 several of those friends. As a matter of fact, three of them that were in the midst of his inner circle that Jesus had with him on that night so that he might endure. You remember there on the one occasion he came back to them, he said, could you not even watch with me one hour? You see, Jesus, although he be God in a body, if you will, God himself placed within that body, John 1 and verse 14, at the very same time he was human. At the very same time as the Hebrew writer tells us, he was willing to suffer the same afflictions that you and I. He endured the same pains. And during that period of time, he needed his friends. And I think we need to underline that in our minds. When you're enduring grief, whether it be by the way of death or disease, or as we said, even divorce, to find a friend that you can stick with, to find a friend upon which you can lean, is going to mean so much to you in those days. And certainly, if we see it from that perspective, we ought to understand it's good to try to keep friends, to try to be with friends, so that when these hours should fall upon us, when these hours should come, that we would have those individuals to help us. But I want to add to that that we, as those looking on from the outside, maybe we're not enduring the grief, but certainly someone we know and love is, we need to be sure that we are those friends. We need to be sure that we are those who are willing to uphold them, to give them a shoulder, if you will, to cry on, to allow them to talk openly and, and truthfully to us so that we may understand them and perhaps even help them. And so even Jesus himself, he needed to lean upon his friends. Second, not only did Jesus lean upon his friends in the Garden of Gethsemane, he expressed his sorrow. Verse 38 said he was sorrowful even unto death. And so we understand by that that Jesus, yes, he endured very difficult times as his life was about to close. He endured great stricken times of grief when he would have to endure just as others would. You remember the scripture there in John chapter 11 and verse 35? It surrounds the death of his good friend Lazarus. And of course, Jesus, knowing what he would do, that he would raise him from the dead, the Bible says there in the shorter verse of the Bible, not the shortest, but the shortest in the English at least, it says, and Jesus wept. There we understand Jesus once again was willing to present his sorrow. And I'm afraid that's what we oftentimes miss. We mentioned a step just a few moments ago as we discussed the idea of this process. A time and during the shock when we rarely want to reveal our grief. We rarely want to show our sorrow because we don't want people to take much time or to bother with us. Maybe we're ashamed of that sorrow. Jesus was not. Jesus was so stricken with his grief on that occasion, you can just see the, the tears flowing from his cheeks, the agony which he was enduring on that evening. And Jesus was willing to express that according to verse 38. But likewise, we learned yet a third thing about him, and that is Jesus at that time looked for solitude. Verse 39 tells us that Jesus went apart from them. He, he put space between him and them. Luke's account, Luke 22 and verse 41 says that Jesus went a stone cast from his friends. And so although it be the case at times, yes, we need to be surrounded and lean on our friends. At the same time, sometimes we just need a moment of solitude. We need to be alone. And this is so important. You know, I think when we're enduring grief, we do look for those friends oftentimes, and perhaps, and Lord willing, they are there, but sometimes we spend too much time with them. We spend so much time with our friends and our family members that we attend to distract ourselves from the grief process in which we must endure, we must pass through. And so we need those moments of solitude. So there's several things involved here. Number one, we ought to be willing to take those moments of solitude, to spend time alone. Of course, we realize we're not never... We're never alone completely. God is in our presence. God is in our midst. And certainly through the scriptures, we have definite access to him, that and through prayer. So we ought to take advantage of those moments. But second, again, as we as onlookers, we need to be willing after a certain period of time, perhaps say after a funeral, maybe give it two or three days, and then we need to step away. We need to allow those closest family members, maybe that spouse or those children or those grandchildren, we need to allow them that alone time, that moment of solitude, where they can endure this sort of grief. Now be ready to come back, be ready to assist, be on call, if you will, to help in any way that you can. But allow them those moments of solitude. It's gonna be so important. 
we typically make the mistake of trying to crowd someone out, trying to be there every moment. That's not really what we ought to do. But then fourthly here, I want you to realize, and this is most important perhaps, and that is that during this time of grief, Jesus prayed to his Father. Both verses 39, 42, and finally in verse 44 even records, and yet he prayed the same words a third time. Jesus prayed to his Father. Now I've often thought about it like this, and I know this must be the case. It must be true. And that is that if Jesus, the very embodiment of God himself, as I call him God in a body, if Jesus prayed to his Father, certainly you and I must. Certainly, if Jesus found the need, if he found the willingness to pray to God the Father in heaven and to beg of him the things that he would ask, certainly you and I must be willing to do that. But you know, I'm guilty, I'll admit. Myself, I'm guilty of not being willing to pray for myself. I enjoy praying for others. I, I find that to be a privilege and an honor. But oftentimes, I have to have it pointed out to me by others as, as they see me or hear me praying. They ought to say, and they do, uh, Jim, you need to pray for yourself in this. You need to add yourself, your health, your situations, your sorrow, your grief, your stresses, whatever it is, add that into your prayers. And so Jesus found a great need to pray. That's the closest connection to God that we would ever have. As a matter of fact, our Lord recorded in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 that men ought to always pray, he said, and faint not. It's certainly the case that prayer is powerful, and it's certainly the case that you and I ought to take part in it. And then finally here, I want to note with you this one, and this one's so important too. And that is in verses 39, 42, and 44, in the midst of these prayers, Jesus accepted the will of God. You know, that again is something that we're unwilling to do, especially in light of death or disease or divorce. We typically ask, why God, why me? We typically might blame God or some even become angry at God and they say, God, I don't understand your will. I don't understand what you're what the point of all of this is. And so I'm going to be angry with you for that. I'm going to despise you, whatever it is, or at least I'm going to turn a deaf ear to you for a while, some would do. And we should never get to that point. But we should always be willing to accept the will of God. That is God's plan, God's ways. You know, we study in the Psalms that God's ways are much higher than our ways. That is, our ways of thinking, the way that we see things through our finite minds do not take hold of the bigger picture. The Roman writer, Romans chapter 8, tells us that God is putting all things together for good. And so certainly it is the case that God has the best intentions for us as humans. God has the greatest desires for us, and he hopes and prays that we will see it his way eventually. And so there are several things involved in this procedure. As we mentioned them, number one, Jesus leaned on his friends. Take time to lean on your friends. It's important to you. Number two, Jesus was willing to express his sorrow and certainly we must do that. Don't be ashamed because you're in the midst of grief. It's a part of life. It's a part of the process through which all men will eventually go. Don't be afraid, as Jesus did, to find and look for solitude at times. Separate yourself from other humans. Allow yourselves those moments, hours, or even several days. Take time to be alone, just you and God. And then we notice how Jesus was willing to pray to his Father. Certainly prayer ought to be a part of all of us in all of our lives every day, but especially when we're in need such as these. And then finally, be willing to accept the will of God. Jesus did. Jesus knew the Father had a plan in store for him, which ultimately we realize and know was to be the Savior of the world. So it's my prayer today that as you begin to understand grief, that you would understand it in light of and what we discussed, the proclamations, the good news about death and dying and disease and divorce even, and how it is the case that in the midst of our grief, God seeks to encourage us that would understand the process through which we go, those 10 steps we mentioned, and understand that from the idea of that news being found out, if you will, that normalcy of life, moving all the way full circle back to moving on. That's where you seek to find. That's where you hope to find yourself, at least eventually. But understand that those steps, the part of that process that we endure, will be there, and we must trust that we can endure. And then finally, never, no, never forget the procedure that is what our Lord set forth by the way of example as recorded in Matthew 26 and other passages to allow us to see a pattern by which you and I can endure our grief. I pray the things we discuss here today have been of some benefit to you. I pray that if you have benefited from them that you'll please give this DVD, pass it on, perhaps order more. Uh, give others an opportunity to see such things as these and pray for them diligently that they will now understand and be able to endure their grief. Thank you.
coming for to carry me home. Swing low, my sweet cherry. Coming for to carry me home. Just want to 